Good afternoon, Albright. How are you guys today? That's weak. Just want to throw that out there. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our special guest today. Um, Anthony Abraham Jack is currently a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, an assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and the Schutzer Assistant Professor at Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. His scholarship appears in the Common Reader, Dubois Review, Sociological Forum, and Sociology of Education, and has earned awards from the Association of American Publishers, American Sociological Association, American Educational Studies Association, Association for the Study of Higher Education, Eastern Sociological Society, and the Society for the Study of Social Problems. Tony held fellowships from the Ford Foundation and the National Science Foundation and was a 2015 National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation Dissertation Fellow. The National Center for Institutional Diversity at the University of Michigan named him a 2016 Emerging Diversity Scholar. In 2020, Muhlenberg College awarded him an honorary degree for his work in transforming higher education. Here's another big list. The New York Times, Boston Globe, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, The Chronicle of Higher Education, The Nation, American Conservative Magazine, The National Review, The Washington Post, CNN, Vice, Vox, and NPR have featured his research and writing as well as biographical profiles of his experiences as a first-generation college student. The Privileged Poor, How Elite Colleges Are Failing Poor Students, which was awarded the 2020 Mira Komarovsky Book Award, 2019 CEP Mildred Garcia Award Junior for Exemplary Scholarship, and the Thomas J. Wilson Memorial Prize, and also named an NPR Books Best Book of 2019, is his first book. Please, everybody, welcome Mr. Anthony Jack. Should I move this one out of the way? Ooh. Thank you for that introduction. Actually, I owe you all a host of thank yous. Um, let me get completely situated. As I mentioned, I owe you all a host of thank yous. You know, first visits are special, but returns are even more so. So I want to say a special thank you for this return to Albright. Um, as a forever first generation college student, any chance I get to visit a campus, I get excited. Um, new buildings to enter, new grounds to walk around, new mascots to meet. Um, and I pray it never gets old. But to be invited back as evidence of a continued dialogue about access and inclusion, and what it means for a university is truly beyond words. So thank you for letting me geek out with you today and be a forever first gen in full force. I was also taught growing up that we should quote, give each other flowers while we yet live. So you see, I wanna also say congratulations because I believe they are in order. I wanna say congratulations to you and to your families born into and chosen for making it to this day. Through long days and sometimes longer nights, you did it. You invested in yourselves, and people who care about you invest in you. And for that, we, a nation and a university, are internally grateful, because we are already better for it. Now, I say that because we've been through a lot these past two years. And as we come up on, a, on another anniversary of being part of this pandemic, we have to take our time to say, you know, we actually made it, like take those small moments to reflect on the past two years, what we have been through and what we have um, been able to accomplish. And I was especially excited to get this opportunity to make a return visit because I was hoping to run into Brian Pan again. So if you're here, which I don't think you are, um, but if you know him, please text him because as I mentioned in my last visit, I had an unexpected surprise. I was sent a Chinese translation of my first book, The Privileged Poor. Now, as somebody who used to get kicked out of libraries to have my book now in one as author is something that's truly special. And so I actually bought with me the first Chinese translation that I ever touched that came out of the box 
So if you know Brian, send him an email, send him a text, send him a WhatsApp, and tell him that I have this for him um, and he can have it and I'll sign it for him. So um, again, if he's not here, text him. You probably know who he is. But in that same spirit, I also wanna say a special thank you to again, the college's unsung heroes who have sustained us in more ways than one. The janitors, security guards, the groundskeepers, the cooks, the nurses, and the secretaries whose work may be invisible to some, but that does not make it any less important. More importantly, those who often are here in invisible roles are on the front lines for many of our new admits. You see, in this talk today, I begin with my, some of my own experiences of being a lower income first generation college student as they serve as background to my research and provide insight into its origins. I then couple this personal narrative with lessons learned from my research on how poverty and inequality shape students' trajectories to and through higher education. You see, one of my favorite quotes in literature reads, and some of you may know this, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Sage advice from a complicated source. These words stuck with me, but I admit when I first heard them, I had to ask myself why. But after thinking about it, after a long shift at my work study job in the gym, it hit me. His word, the words were a much needed reminder to a college junior who worked for a job to support his family back home to slow down. The words dared me to enjoy the quote here and now of being a freshman at Amherst College. You see, beyond my inability to go to concerts and eat pizza at Antonio's, I thought I couldn't go to events, even if they were free, if extra work shifts at the gym became available. Simply put, rest was a luxury I thought I couldn't afford. At the same time, at the same time however, I couldn't escape the reality that my entering Pratt dormitory as a freshman in 2003 and my standing here today as a Harvard professor is a testament to the fact that even undreamt dreams come true. I'm talking about those generational dreams that my grandparents and mother could not always put into words but held onto in their hearts. When the world was coming down around them, when they were excluded from attending the closest school because they were, quote, whites only, they, like W.E.B. Du Bois, grasped, quote, to a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful. They supported a nerdy, chubby kid who read books and watched cartoons and all of his academic endeavors. Their love paved the way even as specific help on the road to college was absent. Put another way, they knew the destination, they just didn't know the way. Many of us today, students, staff, and professors alike, arrived at the college gates along similar uncharted paths. And this is a common reality, you see. Higher education in this country is highly unequal and depressingly stratified. Roughly one out of every two students today are first in their families to attend college. I'll say it again, just one out of every two are the first, to, first in their family to attend college. Yet just 14% of the undergraduates at the most competitive colleges come from the bottom half of the income distribution. Just 14% from the bottom half. Instead, those from lower income families are relegated to, disproportionately relegated to community for-profit and for-profit colleges where resources are fewer and graduation rates are lower. This contrast in destinations is made even more striking when you consider that 38 colleges in America have more students in the top 1% than the bottom 60. I'll say it again. 38 colleges have more students whose families make in excess of $680,000 than students from families that make less than $60,000. At Washington University in St. Louis, the ratio is almost four to one. This disparity is especially troubling given that selected colleges Places like Amherst and Harvard, like my alma maters, and public schools like Michigan and UVA serve as mobility springboards for those disadvantaged families compared to other schools. Yet we were once kept out of these bastions of privilege by a devilish duo. We were excluded by lack of information on the one hand and tuition costs that rivaled or even eclipsed our families' annual incomes on the other. The price of the ticket, as Baldwin would say, was simply too high. Changing this reality, colleges finally realized that they were missing out on America's greatest untapped resource, those from humble means with Herculean drive. And some colleges took action. B 
beginning with Princeton in 1998, colleges began enacting no loan financial aid policies to combat the class inequalities that have a stranglehold on our delicate democracy and even more fragile system of higher education. Amherst announced a similar policy the following year. Through these initiatives, colleges reached out to say that money would no longer be a barrier to entry. It would no longer curtail your success. This made me happy for I benefited from these policies soon after they were enacted. But uncritically praising universities as democratic for simply increasing access reflects a limited civic imagination. An admission letter and generous financial aid do not a diverse college make. Access ain't inclusion. Sometimes I worry if colleges have extended coveted invitations to either eager, excited, able youth before adequately preparing for their arrival. Some universities, I argue, have forgotten an old truth that citizenship is so much more than just being in a place. It's about accessing all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. You see, this is what I study, but it's also what I lived and live. Where are the other poor Black folks? This is the first question I remember asking myself as a college freshman. You see, I had just been invited to partake in what I now call those convocation conversations. And y'all know those innocent chats I'm talking about when people conveniently work in verbal versions of their resumes and narrate the, the stamp behind their, the, sorry, narrate the stories behind the stamps in their passport. You see, my new peers, black and white alike, swap stories of multi-week trips abroad and fancy parties hosted at second homes. They regaled us with personal, pers uh, sorry, they regaled with personal accounts of courtside seats, professional basketball games, and invitations to private premieres to movies that had not yet hit the local AMC. You see, they knew about Canada Goose and they had multiple, multiple versions of it. They talked about, they talked about PJs and where I'm from, as I said, PJs don't mean private jets, but for them it was. You so these were class markers I associated with the rich. My first time ever on a plane was actually traveling from Miami to Amherst for my recruiting trip. What I thought I found that day was the legacy of Bowen and Bach's groundbreaking study, The Shape of the River. In this work, Bowen and Bach showed that an overwhelming majority of Black students, contrary to stereotype, were actually from upper, upper middle and upper class families. They were the sons of lawyers, the daughters of doctors, the children of commerce. I resigned myself to be, yet again, the only poor Black person in a rich white place. Imagine my surprise, however, when one of my classmates who studied abroad in Spain during her junior year of high school turned out to also come from a single parent household that struggled to make ends meet. Feeling comfortable with each other, we shared stories of doing homework by candlelight. We did this not to be romantic, but rather because the power was out. We knew a common struggle all too well that sometime there was a whole lot of month at the end of the money. The vacation homes my peers ventured to, it turned out, were not always their own, but rather those of their wealthy high school peers. Alas, I was not alone. I was not the only one granted access to privileged experiences and places beyond what my family could afford, let alone what they knew about. We see, like my freshman imagination, social science research did not make space for these experiences as part of the larger first generation college student narrative. When they wrote about lower income students, when they wrote about us, they wrote of a, single, a singular story of a singular experience chronicling culture shock and isolation for quote, a group of students at risk. Yet all the while as my research was the first to uncover, colleges were hedging their bets. They were getting their new diversity from old sources, the Andovers, the Exeters, the Deerfields, the Hill Schools of the world. You see, my research focuses on life at an elite university in the Northeast that adopted a no long financial aid policy. And I spoke with 103 Black, White, and Latinx undergraduates in two years of observing undergraduate life to experience a simple question, to ask a simple question. What is, what is, what is the college experience today for lower income students? And I pay particular attention to how lower income students at, at the school have shared beginnings but live ever more divergent lives en route to college. I explore the experiences of those who live in poor 
segregated communities, but who enter from elite boarding day and preparatory high schools like Dalton, St. Paul, and Menlo, and Hockaday, those who I call the privileged poor. I compare their experiences to economically distressed peers who come from local troubled public schools, those who I call the doubly disadvantaged. Now, admittedly, these terms are loaded. To be honest, my choice in terms is purposeful. In addition to the oxymoronic quality of privileged poor that sticks with you, to engage with or even to find fault with the term still forces you to interrogate a question. How can one be both privileged and poor? On what axis of inequality are we speaking? Even using the qualifier doubly inspires an intersectional way of thinking about inequality when there previously wasn't one. But as I share with you, this is as much my professional experience as it is my personal one. And personally, I wanted to move the conversation away from individual differences to focus on how structural inequalities in our neighborhoods and our schools, like segregation, poverty, and the hollowing out of America's center cities and the nation's breadbasket dictate how students navigate what sociologists call the experiential core of college life, those overlooked moments between convocation and commencement. You see, my investigation into this overlooked diversity pushes back against the dangerous downplaying of how prolonged exposure and savage inequalities in our neighborhoods and schools affect how students navigate college, if they make it there at all. For we cannot escape the fact that while some neighborhoods keep us from hurt, harm, and danger, others place us in the thick of it. American streets still bear strange fruit. Because instead of justice rolling like that promised river and righteousness like that mighty stream, some communities get led. See, conventional wisdom dictates you have to know where you've been to know where you're going. The same sentiment is true to understand the undergraduate experience. We must, understand, we must examine and understand where students come from to fully understand why they chart the paths they do once they reach the campus gates. Which students immerse themselves into the college community from day one? Who wants to leave after the first week? Who gets those strong letters of recommendation? But who says, I couldn't breathe here? Who calls their college a toxic environment? Who likens it to deja vu? To overlook the rich diversity of experiences within the first generation college student community is then to base policy on only a partial picture. As it stands now, our understanding of how poverty and inequality, class and culture shape undergraduate life remains incomplete and limits any policies that we try to implement. You see, the privileged poor and double disadvantaged by virtue of their disparate high school experience have different access to what sociologists call dominant cultural capital. And I know it's a term that many of you have heard before, and if you're in a social class, you've heard Bourdieu's definition. But for today, I want us to think of a more colloquial version of it. Those taken for granted ways of being that are valued in a particular context. I'll say it again. Those taken for granted ways of being that are valued in a particular context. We act one way at home and get rewarded and one way out when we're with our friends and get rewarded. College is no different. In fact, colleges expect students to be comfortable and proactive in forging relationships with faculty from the moment they set foot on campus. This is the role to recommendation letters, invitations to special dinners, introduction to covered events. This is the role to emotional support when times get rough. This is the role to the benefit of the doubt even when you're in the wrong. Yet this expectation remains unsaid. There's no manuals of do's or don'ts, when's or how's. If if undergraduates want something, they will come, operates kind of like this gold standard. The college corollary to the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Imagine the culture shock then that some first generation college students experience navigating what sociologist Gene Anion calls the hidden curriculum. You see, Alice, a quick witted Latina with a penchant for short answers, attended a segregated public high school. She revealed to me that her four years before college was filled with peers um, fighting, setting trash cans on fire, and skipping school. Her teachers exhausted themselves maintaining order. 
there was nothing left in the tank for making connections. Needless to say, her transition, her college transition was rough. She says, Tony, college contradicts everything about my life back home. The people, the culture, the very buildings I pass on the way to class every day. Her professor informally told her, she said, hey, Alice, my door is always open. Stop by. But she doesn't believe her. She feels sad. She said, I'm too intimidated, too afraid to talk to people, and said, I rarely go to school to sponsor people for anything. You see, for Alice, hunkering down and doing things on her own is the way to get ahead. And her behavior makes sense. It helped her through middle school where disorder was the norm. It helped her through high school where contact and help from teachers was not always given. Hunkering down and doing things on her own helped her get to school. It helped her get to college. How should she feel in office hours, a term she has never heard before, when teachers at her high school often left before the school bell even rang. Rose, a round cheeked and a round and rosy cheeked sophomore, came from a similar school where the walls were literally falling down. She admits that when it comes to engaging college officials, I'm pretty bad at it. I have never got, I have not gone to office hours this year. And then she, she, she paused. She said, I didn't even go last year either. Even after suffering from a concussion her freshman fall, which made her transition to college, quote, a hot mess, she was too scared to seek out support or help because she was like, I'm not very comfortable. Clearly still shook by the whole ordeal, Rose says, when I got my concussion last year, that's what made me realize I struggled with help seeking. It was a very long time before I talked to anyone I had this spinal and I just broke down. It had been over a month with memory problems, double vision, and concentration, sleeping, and emotional issues. I had really been struggling for over a month and hadn't reached out to anyone because I thought I could do it on my own. I had to finally admit that I needed help. I did get assistance, but I never followed up with these people. I don't like asking for help. Even in the throes of trying to study and socialize while concussed, which undermined her ability to function, Rose chose to shoulder the burden alone. In contrast, Agoon, a reflective and discerning Latina, hails from a troubled neighborhood, but attended an affluent boarding school with a $200 million endowment. Her largest class was 12 students. More, more of a contact with teachers, both inside and outside the classroom, was an everyday occurrence. Of her six teachers that year, her six high school teachers, half of them had PhDs. Studying abroad at her school was not only an option, it was encouraged. Office hours were built into the culture and the very structure of the school day. It should come as no surprise then that she feels, quote, empowered to go and talk to the professor and say, hey, I want to meet with you. She goes on to say, my school instilled in me that I'm allowed to do that. It's actually my right. When her instructor was away from campus, Agoon had no qualms calling his cell phone for prearranged virtual office hours, despite her friend's surprised looks. And in a similar way, Clarissa, who also attended a wealthy day school, recalls talking to her advisor, as she says, just because. And in these happenstance conversations that were, all, that were flowing and, and wide ranging, she discovered she had access to supports that she didn't even know her college offered. She recalls, my academic advisor has been a huge resource. She's helped me with classes, helped me get loans. My computer broke, she explains. So she helped me figure out how to get a loan to replace it. Apparently she was friends with my financial aid advisor. She helped me get in contact with her, and importantly, this is what she says. She says, she helped her to help me. You see, what was new for Alice was old for Agoon. What was a mismatch for Rose was a match for Carissa. These differences result not in individual deficiency, but rather societal ones. But colleges mistakenly, erroneously, See Agoon as engaged and Alice as doing just fine. But here's, the, here's, the, here's how that problem get, gets multiplied. 
Here's how that, pro that problem becomes compounded. Colleges reward students, not necessarily based upon their ability, their drive, but how comfortable they are engaging with university officials. One residential advisor shared with me that when it comes to nominating students for awards, prizes, and fellowships, she says, the nomination process, process is relationship dependent, unfortunately. It enables students who develop relationships a leg up in the process. And with the look of someone admitting a very uncomfortable truth, she says, oftentimes the best candidates are not put forward. It's hard to tease out what is meritocracy and what is nepotism, favoritism, cronyism, or whatever you want to call it. You see, undergraduates from America's forgotten neighborhoods and ignored schools are truly disadvantaged if colleges continue to privilege privilege. Yes, engaging college officials is smart. It's expected, and it's even rewarded. But we have to realize that these lessons do not fall evenly across the populace. As the old maxim goes, talent may be evenly distributed across the country, but opportunity is not. Colleges cannot assume that all students have been permitted to practice these, these skills, let alone master them, before they set foot on campus. We as college officials must be proactive in how we give help, how we welcome students into the fold. Colleges and universities must not label those who do not immediately seek out support as those being less deserving of it. We must return to basics. And I look forward to tomorrow and engaging your faculty on this because I want us to, when I say return to basics, I mean think back to those first days when you just learned something new and pushing them to, pushing us all to understand what we have taken for granted. I always say, let's do some, a simple exercise. Let's define office hours. Why do faculty and staff always say when they are, but almost never say what they are? Let us in, the, let us in this room think back when we first heard the term office hours. Was it at a dinner table at home? Was it in class on your first year of college? Was it something that you knew you would always do because you been around the college environment so much, you've been around college people so much that you knew that it was part of the process? Or was it something wholly new? Something that you had to look up yourself and understand that you really had never had the opportunity to experience anything similar to what you are about to walk into? Or give us a, to give you another example, when you think of the word fellowship, do you vision going across the pond to study at Oxford or Cambridge? Or do you have visions of reaching across the pews to shake your neighbor's hands and say, peace be on to you? There are lessons that colleges must learn, or rather, more accurately, that colleges must remember. Those for whom the college environment is new should not be the only ones forced to change, to grow, to adapt. Now, I am not naive. Knowing how to navigate social relationships with faculty and staff is not the only hurdle that lower income and first generation college students face. There are some things that no amount of cultural capital can combat. You see, walking around trips in March, sorry, walking around campus in March during normal times, one usually hears stories of trips home to rest, Europe for backpacking, Mexico for partying. Spring break, however, means something wholly different when you're broke. As Valeria, a lower income college student says from California, she says, there's always famine during spring break. Alice and Agoon both know hunger sting all too well and not just when food stamps ran out at home. They, in, they encounter food insecurity, not knowing where their next meal was coming from when they're, during spring break, when their college decided to close all eateries during these recesses. You see, their college assumes that all students depart campus for fun in the sun during Thanksgiving, spring break, and this made up mid-semester break that they, own, that they are the only college that celebrates it. And sadly, this is a common reality. Of all the colleges at the time of my study that have adopted no loan financial aid policies, so those that are the most progressive on paper when it comes to aid, 
only 18% of them kept their dining halls open during spring break. To put another way, that's fewer than one in five. This is not a new problem despite new interest in it. This is a problem that generations of students have endured. And I'm one of those students. I faced this a decade and a half ago at Amherst when they opened, when they opened the gates but forgot to keep the doors open to those who they let in. You see, nestled next to my extra long twin sheet that we purchased on sale at Marshall's was an unexpected stowaway. The reality that access to food would not always be a given. I remember walking past Valentine Dining Hall and the lights would be out. Only the emergency exit line blazed red in the darkness. The chairs were stacked on top of the table as if Tito had just finished vacuuming but had moved out of, eye, out of line sight. Through the dim lighting of that emergency exit line, you could still see the plates and trays through the gate that now bar you from entry. You could see the table that you sat at with your friends day in and day out for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Only now, they were on vacation. They were skiing on snow and on the beach. They were with their families chilling or fighting or everything in between. They were doing okay, but now you were trying to figure out where your next meal was coming from. At Renown, the school that I study, cafeteria closures result in one out of every seven students facing food insecurity. I want you to think about that for a second. At one of the world's wealthiest universities with its multi-billion dollar endowment, lower income students can chart hungry days on their calendar without fail. To make matters worse, some colleges actually charge students upwards of $35 a day to stay in their room or the room of somebody on vacation. One college went as far as to change the locks on the outside of the buildings to prevent entry. It should not be surprising that estimates show that two out of every five students in this country undergraduates face food security on a monthly basis, especially when your university is part of the reason, is, is, especially if your university is part of the people who are locking you out and keeping you away from that source of food. One student asked me a tough question that made me think more about the reality behind those rates. She said, Tony, how can you support yourself when you can't even feed yourself? Capturing this reality with comedic seriousness, Ariana says that, quote, spring break is the real Hunger Games. But just how close it comes to living in the districts is downright depressing. One young white woman with a pixie haircut attended a IBG, a first-gen conference for students, for, for, uh, sorry, a, a conference for first-generation college students in the Ivy League. And in a room full of 200 people, she stood up and she said, I have a question for you. She said, did you notice gender differences in how students dealt with spring break? I knew where she was going, but I wanted her to feel empowered to tell her story. And after a pause and adjusting her, and adjusting her sweater, which ironically had Columbia University stitched across it, she explained what she did during her last spring break. She increased her online dating activity in the lead up to spring break to secure dates the following week. You see, in order, you see, banking on gender norms of older men paying for the first meal, she felt that her only option was to treat OK Cupid as if it was DoorDash, Tinder as if it was Grubhub. In order to eat, she offered her time. This makes no sense. Far too many undergraduates year after year, and far too many face it day after day. And we have to realize, and especially in the times that we find ourselves in, that these realities extend beyond just what lower income students face. What about the students who don't have a home to go to? What about the students who know that home and harm are synonymous? You see, new students require taking on new responsibilities. Colleges must move from access to inclusion. 
psychologists must move beyond focusing on just who we admit to the experiences of those new admits from the moment they set foot off, to set foot on a campus as new students to the moment they become new alumni. Because to embark upon the noble and crucial task of making, making our institutions look more like the world and not just the top 1%, we must question what we take for granted about where students come from, about what resources they need, about what we are doing to support them. Students, students' experiences underscore how access and inclusion are two separate institutional mandates. We must work to ensure that students don't just graduate. They do so whole and healthy, ready for the next adventure. Getting students to graduation is, to me, an easier goal than getting students to the point where they are not limping across stage, saying that they will never set foot back on our campus again because of the harm and the hell that we have put them through. We must work to ensure that we support the full student in ways that, we, that the university has not, has not before because of who we have been catered to, who, have been, who we have been catering to for so long. Because as each class becomes ever more diverse, colleges' connections to once overlooked communities become ever more pronounced. The consequences of these new ties are that various inequalities are brought into sharper and sharper relief. This brings up new questions. Do we know how to support students who grow up on farms and center cities? Are we prepared to help students through a bad harvest as well as through the death of a family member due to gang violence? We cannot run from these new connections. We must embrace them. And more importantly, we must learn from them. As Viola Davis says, Diversity is not a hashtag to be celebrated today and put on the back burner tomorrow. We must demand better of our alma maters. We must demand better of ourselves. When James Baldwin reflected on America, his home, he noted, I love America more than any other country in this world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. To the students here, your college is your home, and you are its citizenry. Make your voices heard. Go to office hours. Meet with people. Understand that you are not a burden on them. You are allowing them to do their job. No longer should you, to borrow from Paul Lawrence Dunbar, wear the mask that grins and lies, the one that hides our, sheep, hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. You have paid that debt of human gal many times over. So I close with this. As you chart nearly 175 years of educating tomorrow's leaders, as you live up to your alma mater and pursue both truth and justice, as your seal shows to the world, dare to demand as much of Albright as all might demands of you. And in that quest, go back to those, le those lessons that Langston Hughes taught us oh so long ago when he implored us to hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. So be unapologetic, be bold, be you. Thank you. And as I shared, this is actually my favorite part of any conversation that I have with the university, and it is my ability to hear from students and members of staff and faculty at a new university. So we have time for questions, and I would love it especially if the question, first question came from a student. And I'm okay with silence. I teach grad students, so. <laughs> Somebody from the fourth row is gonna ask a question. They're looking at each other.
three, two. All right, cool. That's a good question. Um, so I'm gonna give you the I'm gonna give you the honest answer, and I'm gonna give you the real answer. Uh, I'll start with the real answer. The real answer is when I got to Amherst and I got the convocation, and I saw the robes, and I saw the pageantry, I saw all that. I fell in love with the life. I was just like, I gotta get me one of those robes. And I was like, oh, why is everybody wearing like a pink or a light red robe? I was like, oh yeah, that's right. Half y'all went to Harvard. I said, okay, bet. Uh, and that's why, and I fell in love with the life of the professor, to be honest. The, we didn't, the, the, the one thing that we did not have growing up was security and flexibility, right? My mom was a security guard at a middle school. My brother's a janitor at a hospital and, and my old elementary school. Money wasn't overflowing and we just like, I, I still have not been to Disney World and I'm from Miami, right? So we didn't have that. And when I saw the life that my professors lived, not the academic life, but like the freedom that being an academic gave, which is so enticing. Right, the ability to craft your own narrative, craft your own story, study, generally speaking, what you want, right? Because you choose a program based upon like, oh, you know, am I more of a historian? Because I love the archives. Am I more of an economist? I love data set. Or I'm more of a sociologist and I can do interviews. Or am I more of an anthropologist? I can just like live in a community. And then you get to write about it. You get to write about who you want, who you are, and all of that. And I was just like, wait a minute. You're telling me I get to live a comfortable life. I get to wear this robe twice a year. I get to chill and, and, and interface with people who, and, and that, that feels, that even if the work is draining, you don't feel tired, right? That kind of, rather, even though you're tired, you don't feel drained. And so when I realized, I was like, I am in love with that life, the, the complete totality of a life, which is why I recommend anybody in here, if you're thinking about a profession, shadow someone in it. Right, you gain exposure to teachers, you see a lot of doctors, and depending on your life, you may en engage with a lawyer, but we often don't get to see what other people do on a day-to-day -day basis in the same way that we do when we get to school. But I used the opportunity, I was like, yeah, this, this, is, this is for me. I was like, okay, this, I can do this. So that's, a, that's the, the real answer. I was like, yo, those three stripes um, that you get to wear on your arm, I was like, okay, love it. The, the honest answer is, is tied to that. When I was thinking about going to graduate school and I got to graduate school, I realized no one was talking about, everybody was like, it was almost like they were being lazy. And they were like, okay, you first gen, you're gonna have this experience. It was like a one-to-one, -one, it was like a one-to-one -one thing every single time. There was never any conversation about the like diversity within the group. I'm just like, this is, something's wrong, like this is not the whole story. And so when I was able to bring those two things together, right, the life I wanna live and the kind of impact I wanna make, like shifting this entire narrative, right, changing people's fundamental understanding of the first gen experience, the fact that I was able to do both of those together, like the old saying is like, you know, if you love what you do, you don't, you, nev you never work a day in your life. Right, and I was able to have that kind of connection in the two. But it was, it was really getting an understanding of, I do want to be a forever student, right? If you're telling me that my job could be reading books, writing articles, writing books, teaching students, mentoring people, which I was already doing in like the, the big SIP, little SIP program that we had with, within the Black Student Union and other groups, I was just like, wait, I can like pick parts of the life that the parts of life that I like and put it all together. And that is like 85 percent, 75, 85 percent of the professor's job. I was like, that was for me. And so it was like combine it two together. It's, it's, and it's perfectly OK to put the I in the Y. Right. So he's like, oh, no, you should make an objective decision. 
what's the, like, we can talk about objectivity all we want, but like, no, if you are passionate about something and that something is one act of the job, why not do it? Because if I have to get up at, what, I got up at four, if I have to get up at 4.45 in the morning to make it to a place, you better believe I'm excited to make it to that place. I'm not waking up at 4.45 for, for, for just, you know, for fun. That's not my wake up time. But if I am, I'm passionate about what I'm waking up for. And so to be able to have that conversation. So if you ever get that pebble in your shoe moment at some time while you're here, that's something that you keep returning to, that thing that you can't, that, that always in the back of your mind that's either annoying you or it's exciting you because you, you keep returning to it, that may, be to, that may be insight into what you should pursue. Because if you can't turn away from it, if you something that is always grabbing that attention, explore it. And maybe, maybe do just one summer internship, just explore that. And you might say, you know what? Law and order really did mess up my mind. Like, this is nothing like being a lawyer. And, but you do find that actually being part of a think tank is more like what you want. Because you get to, you know, you get to look at the law and all that kind of stuff. So when you think about that pebble in that shoe moment, if there's something that you read in class, you keep coming back to it, try to find a way to explore it. We had a question here in the front. Yeah, that's a great question. I think one thing that I have, and I'll expand it even beyond Harvard, is I'll never forget when the book came out. So the book came out in 2019. Actually, March 1st will be the, the, the three-year anniversary. And I'll never forget that next fall from Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and text messages, how many notifications I got of faculty defining office hours in their class, right? Just, just like a slew of messages with people, you know, community colleges, regional comprehensive, state universities, Ivies, you know, it, it ran the gamut. People were saying, um, on the slide, people would say, you know, after reading Jack 2019, which is academic speech, like how you cite, right? You're like, after reading The Privilege Poor, after reading this, 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 I've decided to take the first 15 minutes, of class, 15 minutes of class and actually explain some terms that I say all the time that I thought everybody else knew, but they didn't, right? And that just, and that was really cool because that's not traceable for me, right? I can't necessarily trace that in the same way that I can do how many universities have changed their dining hall policies during recesses. And so nearly 80 colleges have changed their policies in some way, shape, or form around um, spring break and recesses. And so I focus, and I talk about this in the book, I focus on, on spring break because one, it's a break that is not attached to any kind of religious holiday officially, right? Even though Easter, you know, but it was like a different kind of connection. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a truly optional break. And to use it, and now, and also spring break has become like a break of, a break of privilege. So, but university says, okay, well, if we're gonna listen to it for spring break, we're not gonna like open during spring break, but close during Thanksgiving break. So they open. And then some were saying like, well, what about our students who can't afford to go home during this winter session? The whole winter session, including the, you know, the high holidays, we're gonna stay open longer than what we were before. And so there, have been, there has been an expansion of the, the academic slash dining services calendar as a result of the book. And so there have been significant changes like on the two things I mentioned here, but then there are different lessons that people have used, right? So for example, mental health services 
as well as counseling services have changed the way in which they've interacted with students, or if not, or adjusted to include a different approach to getting students in their doors. And so those things have been really, really important. And, and it is good to see that my, it's good to see my alma maters change, right? Both Amherst College and Harvard. Um, I got this amazing message that, you know, that floored me to, um, from the president of Smith College in Massachusetts. Uh, so Smith actually just went no loan, financial aid policies, right? So they were able to raise a certain amount of money to be able to go, to go, to go no loan for students who make less than a certain amount of money. And she was like, and she mentioned that your work was instrumental in the argument, right? That's not something that you can trace, but I am forever thankful for those, those type of messages that come in because they remind me of why I do the work that I do, right? Because now I can say that, yes, I'm involved in Amherst. Yes, I contribute in an active alumni, uh, uh, active alum. And yes, I donate to the school. My, I donate my class year in dollars. So that's, you know, um, that's something that we do. And, but I can also say that no student will ever have to face a spring break like I do. And sometimes to me, that matters more than some of the accolades that have come from the book. Because that is a lasting impact because Spring break is hard. It's right before final exams, right before moving out. It's literally the on your set, on your, um, on your mark, get set, go moment of the spring semester. It's a mad dash to the end. You have people who are taking a week or two weeks to chill, to soak up some sun, especially if you're up here and you know, in northern parts of the country, right? There is, there's very little. Like I'm in Massachusetts, we had 20 inches of snow um, last week. But other people are now in Montego Bay, in Tulum, all these places, relaxing before this mad dash. But you're there scrounging for food, like trying to figure out where, what you can afford, all this kind of mental calculations. Can I afford this? What if I, you know, what if I skip, you know, eat breakfast but skip lunch and then all of that tires you out, let alone thinking about where your peers are and what they're doing. So those are some of the moments of, I hope pushing schools to think less, to think less, less that diversity is all they need and to focus a little bit more on access. I saw a hand on this side, but I could be wrong. No? Okay. So again, uh, <laughs> y'all making me do that real versus truth answer again. I applied. My first week in graduate school, I was scared because someone said that their dissertation cost them $12,000. And I was like, I don't think I've ever seen $12,000 in my life. And I was like, okay, I'm broke. I live in an expensive city now. My mama and brother broke, and I sent money home to them. So I was like, okay, follow the money. So that's what I did. I applied for every single fellowship I possibly could. I applied for everything that, that did not say, Anthony Jack, you cannot apply for this. I put myself out for everything. I applied for the four, the NSF. I applied for fellowship at Amherst College. I applied to the National Academy. I applied everywhere. I did not realize that me trying to chase security, right, would be the thing that made my application stand out to certain schools when I was on the job market. When I got my first job interview um, at Rice University in Texas, Houston, she called and was like, hey, this is, um, you know, she said her name and she's like, I'm from Rice University. Um, I would like to invite you to come to give an on-campus job talk. And I was like, okay, oh, I was like, yo, I'm not going, maybe I, may, maybe I won't be unemployed after graduate school. I'm like, this is awesome. 
And she said, I want you to know one thing that made your application stand out above all others. Like we love your publication record. It's really great. Um, we love the novel ideas, but she also, she said, we have not had the same level of success with our graduate students getting fellowships that you have all won. So you never know what on your resume or what on your um, CV is going to be what people look for. And so I was just, I, I'll never forget that moment. I was just, I, I was literally thinking, I was like, I was just trying not to go into debt in graduate school doing a qualitative dissertation. I was trying to find money. I was trying to do this work on my own time. And here it is as a key signature feature on my application. So my team became the fellowship's office, right? I went and got my cover letter and my uh, uh, personal statement and my research statement ripped apart for an entire month. I went every week and they were like, it was only, two, it was only 500 words in five, 500 words. She probably gave 500 words in comments. Went the first week, worked through them. Went the second week, she gave another 500 words, worked through them. The third week, she gave about 200 words, only like a page, almost a page. The last week she was like, you're getting there. You still have not nailed this. And after that meeting, I did and got, and got the fellowships. So it's like you, your team needs to be the resources at the school as well as other places that's going to help you achieve that particular goal. And again, her job was fellowships, was fellowships. So I, I didn't feel, so I didn't feel that burden of like setting up four meetings in a, in, a, in a month's time, because that's, in, in graduate school, it's a little bit different. Like, it, graduate school is much, it's a much smaller program and different, than, and no one was going to her. So she was like, you want to come back next week? I said, yeah, I'll be back. And she, and, and I think at one point she was like, yeah, you might be back, you might not, because a lot of people come for the first meeting, see how much red ink is on something, and they don't come back. I was like, no, I'll be back. Because if you think this is hard, like having somebody rip something apart is hard, this is easy. Doing homework at night with no lights, doing um, like getting four gallons of water because the water is out, that's hard. This is easy. Like this is, this is academic work. The stuff that helped that I had to do to get here, that was the hard stuff. So when you reach out to those services, right? Mental health services, career services, um, the outreach office, those people become part of your team because they know they know things about the industry, the sector, the part of the city that you want to go into to volunteer, to work, to do whatever. And it's their job to actually do it. And so they've been doing it for years, right? You have people who have been on the faculty for a long time, but sometimes more importantly, you have staff members who have decades of connection to different people in industry. And they're just waiting to make those introductions, especially the people who are serious about mentoring in that way. And so when you build up a team, just right, like I ask students all the time, like, who gonna, like as a sophomore, you have a year in, I was like, so, so who are going to be your day ones? To put it as straightforward as possible. Who by the end are you going to turn back to and say, here are four or five people who can write me a letter of recommendation. Here are four or five people who are going to think about me for a prize, for an award, for an honor, for a job, even when I'm not, we, even when I don't know about those positions. Like that's what I was able to, to, to develop at Amherst. And I love that. I mean, when I went to Amherst, Amherst was only 1600 students. To this day, I had this one professor. I took three of her classes. Her name is Kristen Bumiller. Took three of her classes. And to this day, I've spent three birthdays at her house, two inaugurations. She's been to every first professional talk that I've given in, as a graduate student and a professor. And I literally will walk to her house now as a, as, as a professor, because now she, cause she, lives, she lives in Boston, but teaches at Amherst. Right, so she, was that, she is one of those people who had an imprint on my time at Amherst that has lasted 
what, almost 20 years now. Because I went in, at, I went in in 2003. Yeah, because this is my 15th year anniversary of graduating. Yeah, 2022. And so you just, you, and, and I have staff members and I have um, a dean who at, at Amherst who is very, very similar. So it's like, who are going to be those people? And, you, and, and, and I want to offer something. Just because someone can help you, is in a position to help you and will, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't allow them to be in your life. You're not using them. You're not just being in their life for, for that purpose, right? You are in their life and they're in your life because you want to. And it just so happens that it is their job to help students and you happen to be a student, right? You have to stop thinking, we have to start like stop thinking it as this antagonist, antagonistic thing where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to get a reward from it. So I'm using them if I do. No. If someone says that, if someone's job description is help students get internships at hospitals and medical research facilities, you're not using them if they help you get a job at a hospital or a medical research facility. You are allowing them to do their job. I mean, as a faculty member, there are sometimes nothing more frustrating than sitting in your office during office hours when no one comes and then you get papers back or tests back and almost the entire class get the same thing wrong. Not because it wasn't taught, but because rather it was like that, that moment that there could have been a little more clarification in office hours either to realize that not everybody was getting it. Because I've had professors who, who's had that moment where everybody got the same question wrong and it, it, it wasn't addressed until after the exam. But I've also had a moment where four people went to office hours with the same question on the same thing and the, the professor came to class the next day and say, it seems like a lot of you are struggling with this same question that was testing this principle and gave three examples and then nobody got it wrong after that, right? So you never know, you could be having the same question but you're allowing people to do their job. Can you have one more question? Awesome. Is that a hand in the back corner or you're scratching your nose? Nose, okay. So we have a last question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a tough one. So the next the so the question is and to even kick sorry, it's moving. Um to even kick it up a notch is like how are some of these inequalities exacerbated by the pandemic and what are the universities doing about it? Um, that's actually the book that I'm writing right now that, that I'm using my fellowship year to write. Um, and I'm about half, and I'm halfway through with it now and I'll finish the second half this semester. It is one thing to say that COVID exacerbated the very inequalities that colleges and students' lives. But the, the reality is COVID exacerbated the inequalities that universities were already struggling with, let alone sometimes ignoring in students' lives. And what this book does is it shows the ways in which the inequalities were exacerbated, but not in the hopes to create a post-pandemic campus, but rather an equitable one because a post-pandemic campus can look exactly the same as when we had before, right? Paying a lip service to diversity, doing the bare minimum to just say like, okay, we're gonna recruit students, we're gonna give them financial aid, and that's it but a more equitable one addresses the various inequalities that students went home to. Not saying that universities can change the neighborhood, which they, in some respects, can. If you think about Chicago and Yale and universities that have a very interesting history with the local community. But more, if we know that the last two years were hard on everybody, but were hell on some, how do we change our mental health services? How do we change our admissions? Because many schools are now saying, oh, we're going to go SAT, um, SAT optional. I'm okay with that. One, I think SAT needs, 
I think the SP needs to go. Look, instead of saying you're going SP optional, I want more time thinking about the why you are going SP optional. Oh, we're not going because students don't have, you know, like students can't make it into the thing. No, that's not the only reason. Think a bit more. Oh, it's going online, so that's okay. But oh, wait, a lot of our students don't have access to online. A lot of our students don't have access to space to take a test, let alone attend a class. A lot of our students don't have access to, you know, X, Y, and also that list gets really, really long when you try to understand the why behind some of these major decisions. That's, and I want to push the universities to think about those things, right? Beyond the money, what are the resources that we need to make sure that we understand the undergraduate experience? Because while the privileged poor focused on life on campus, right, getting students into office hours and things like that were kind of like more centered inside the college gates, the next book lays waste to the idea of a college bubble, especially for Black, Latinx, and Native students. Right? There is no college bubble when home comes to you with a two o'clock in the morning phone call saying someone, you lost someone. Or that two, that, that 2 p.m. call saying, hey, can you send money by five o'clock unless they're going to cut the water off. Right? There is no college bubble when there is no distance between, when, when there is no distance between you and home. And so that is something that I want to, to underscore. But I thank you all for this return, and I very much look forward to engaging with the faculty inside on tomorrow. Thank you.